following the death of a man in County Antrim this morning. He was found in Bath Terrace in Port Rush at around 20 past two. And an Irishman's being treated in ICU after a shooting in southern Spain this morning. The scene at Opium Beach Club in Marbella remains closed today. That's it for now. More in an hour. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Swap frozen pizza for the real deal in Pisa, Venice or Naples. Dry in most areas tonight with a few scattered showers. It'll be warm with the lowest temperatures of 14 to 19 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The News Round on Off The Ball. With Gillette for an effortless finish to your day. New Gillette Labs Razor with exfoliating bar. This is News Talk. And you're very welcome along to Monday Night's Off The Ball. It's Richie McCormick here with you right through until 10pm tonight. And as uh, prior to the news, we're going to do our very best uh, to squeeze the last couple of days of sporting excellence into the next three hours of radio. And we're going to look back on Limerick's All-Ireland Final Hurling success uh, with the company of James Me- James O'Connor and Shane McGrath. That's coming up after 9 o'clock tonight. And we'll have Monday Night Rugby as well with Matt Williams and Keith Wood after the weekend in which Ireland secured a first ever series victory over New Zealand on New Zealand soil. And ask what next for Ireland ahead of the World Cup in a year's time. And we'll get some reaction as well on top of Limerick's All-Ireland Final success from the Treaty County itself. You can get in contact tonight by texting us 53106 for 30 cent is the number. You can tweet us as well at Off The Ball. We'll be only too delighted to hear from you. Joining us for the news round uh, tonight is Amory Donlan. Amory, good evening to you. Hi, Richie. And also Michael McCarthy with the Hello, laptop. Hello, Thank you for joining How are us you? tonight. Um, one of those mad weekends where there's just, there's almost too much on or the stuff that's on is just so seismic that you don't know where to look. You're being flung from incident to incident and it felt like that over the weekend, especially yesterday. Uh, but we'll start um, by asking for your, your highlight, your standout your capo di tutti capi of moments of the weekend, <laughs> if you will. Well, I don't know. So the, so the hurling was pretty incredible yesterday. I feel like if Rory had won the Open, we would have just, like, I don't know what we would have been able to even do on the show tonight. Cancel the balcony. Too Look, much, yeah. like, you know, to combine with the fact that we all should be off today because it's, like, 30-odd <laughs> degrees out. But uh, for possibly uh, the fact that the hurling final delivered and was such a great game and it looked like it was getting away from Limerick and they came back to it would probably make it a highlight for me but I do understand there's, an, there's a natural bias to that I think objectively the rugby game um, and the performance and the result I think does kind of stand above everything else I was also um, I was doing Virgin Media on <laughs> RMDM am during the game which meant that I had a good bit of it in the company of uh, the, the radio commentators. Michael Corcoran and Don Lennon did a great job. So possibly my highlight of the weekend might have been driving down the M50 at, <laughs> at half nine or ten o'clock in the morning and realising that there was... Uh, the, I, I didn't know the situation, I didn't know how long was left and yeah. suddenly I was told that there was 90 seconds left in the clock and realised, oh, this is happening! And just kind of driving down the middle lane of the M50 with both fists in the air going, yes! And then kind of realising that people who probably weren't listening to the rugby were driving by me going, what is going on with that psychopath? At 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> please drive responsibly out there, of course. I'm sorry, one hand in the air. Sorry, <laughs> you, yeah. you said both, Vic. You can't backtrack on that now. Uh, Amory, your standout? Yeah, the hurling and I suppose the fact that it was a competitive final because we haven't had a great hurling final in a few years now and arguably Limerick's three All-Irelands in the last few years um, weren't competitive, even 2018. Like I know there was only a point in it, but that was because Joe Canning did what only he can do really for the last 10 minutes. So there was kind of almost question marks over them um, you know, like, did they win like a real battle in a final, and did they beat um, a team like Kilkenny? And they answered all those questions yesterday. And the fact that Kilkenny, it wasn't level until well into the second half. So you can look at it like, did Limerick keep them at bay, or did Kilkenny just refuse to go away? I suppose it's a bit of both. But yeah, like it felt right into it that the game could go either way. I'd love to have known the psychology, like, kind of. If Kilkenny had gone ahead, which they never did, they only levelled it, um, would Limerick have buckled? But we'll never know. But the fact that it was a competitive game and a cracker in the end, it felt as well in the build-up that everyone there kind of, it felt like a momentous occasion for them. You know, everybody back after COVID and Limerick had won two of their All-Irelands. I know there was half a stadium last year, but it's not the same. I was so. surprised at how much of a deal it actually did feel like. Like it, it brought I felt to mi- that yeah. through the screen, It yeah. brought to mind 
remember that FA Cup final? Was it 2020 where there was, it was the first time that there was people at a match? Well, obviously it would have been 21, I guess. The Carabao Cup final. Where there was the yeah. first time where there was people at a match and it felt like for the first time in ages that there were proper stakes on offer in a game because you're like, oh God, the crowd is actually playing a massive influence here. Yeah. There was a real sense of celebration about being there, about being one of the 80-odd thousand in Croker yesterday. And you can't, pe- people tend to oversell occasion a bit much. But I think it definitely lent itself to that yesterday. The fact that it was so big, both sets of supporters are pretty loud and pretty full on in terms of their support for their counties. Yeah. And it really did make it. If you were there, by all means, let us know it's the same for you. Give us a text, 53106. But like, that came through the screen for me, big style. Yeah, and the emotion that players feel, I think, is amplified you know, mm. when that environment is there. But also, I think, I think Amory's point about it being a close game and Limerick having to dig so deep to win it is there because... I think sometimes from the outside looking in, I remember having conversations like during the league when Limerick were going badly, where there was like, "Look, you know, be all right. Limerick are going to win the All Ireland," and they did. But we forget that like the work that has to go into doing that for the group of players, just because sometimes we can look from above and say, "Oh, I think that's ultimately what's going to happen," almost lessens it in some ways. Yeah. Whereas for them as a group, the work that they have to go into, the demons they probably have to overcome, the doubts and so on that they will have to overcome to go and do that. And then for Kilkenny to come back at them and be playing so well, and for it look like Limerick forwards couldn't get the ball in their hand for about a five-minute period, it, it was like, this is getting away from You them. could see that conversation on the sideline between yeah. Kylie and Kinnerk where they were like, how are we actually going to wrestle this ball back and get it into our forwards? Like, and then like, and then to go and come back and win it. And then add to that, it's three in a row. Mm. This is something that, like, we grew up on these on Kilkenny teams and you forget that three in a row is such a seismic thing especially for a county like Limerick this is a, this is the a non-big three county winning three All-Irelands in a row it is beyond phenomenal I know we're going to talk about that from kind of a Limerick point of view in a little while but I actually you know with cold light a day you forget that you assumed they were going to win the All-Ireland and you say Limerick have just won three All-Irelands in a row you know? But also it was the third time they had to dig deep this year so arguably it's their most impressive season and unbeaten yeah. At the end of it. You know what I mean? They don't have to be unbeaten to win in All Ireland these days, but they did it. They got two draws against Clare mm. where, you know, maybe they arguably weren't at their best. Were they at their best against Galway? Last ten minutes they did everything they needed to do. Very similar to yesterday in a way. You know what I mean? Like if you if you look the la- if you just watch the last two or three minutes and injury time yesterday, you're thinking Limerick are significantly better here because they finished so strongly. They're just such such an impressive group of players. Do you know the way like some finals end up getting christened after like the player that has been most synonymous with them? Like you, you hear the, the Stanley Matthews final going back to Wembley in the 50s and then the Gerrard final, I guess, in the 2006 in the FA Cup terms. Would you class yesterday as the Gerard Hegarty final? Given the, like, the size of his performance, that seemed to be a player who went... There be some players kind of can get overawed by the occasion. They kind of yeah. shrink back into themselves a little bit and or else they do something stupid. Hegarty was like, this is an all Ireland final and by God, I'm going to make it my one. That seemed to be an impression I got from minute one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's actually very, very true. He definitely took the game by the scruff of the neck. In some ways, I don't know if you could call it the Groat Hegarty final because last year was kind of the Groat Hegarty final as well and he got 2-2. Two, two. He can have more than one. And he got 1-5 this year. So is it just that I, I, when he got the goal, I'm thinking, yeah, Groat Hegarty and all Ireland finals are just a beautiful combination of things and... Like it was such a brilliant goal from the pick up to the I don't think I've ever seen a slitter hit into that part of the net before. It was just perfection. And then everything he did afterwards. And do you know what? His legs went with the rest of them. Um but if you look at that last ten minutes, what was driving the Limerick forwards were the subs and Kyle Hayes came into it. Mm. But if you watch it again, Hegarty has little flicks, little half wins of possession, just doing enough constantly and that that's as important as the scores he got you know what I mean he was yeah if you're if you are going to associate yesterday with one man it definitely will be Hegarty yeah we'll start with uh, I guess a little bit of reaction uh, on the news round to Limerick's win the news round of course brought to you with Gillette Labs for an effortless finish to your day and Marie we start Shannon side yeah the Limerick hurlers are back in the city having made a bit of history yesterday their two point win over Kilkenny at Croke Park where the final score was 131 to 226 saw them win a third consecutive senior All-Ireland title it was also their fourth in five years having ended a 45 year wait back in 2018 they now join Kilkenny Cork and Tipperary as the only counties to enjoy a three in a row speaking to Ashley O'Reilly at the team hotel 
Hotel this morning. Manager John Kiley said that this is dreamland stuff. In 2017, if you said to me we'd be one, I'd have snapped the hand off you and been forever happy and grateful, you know, to have had that. But yeah, they're, they're an incredible bunch. Paul has done just an awful serious job with these lads, you know, in terms of the coaching and developing them as players and from a skill set, from a physical perspective. I think as people they've developed as well over the years and they're incredibly strong and resilient mentally. Carlin has done a super job there. Um, but we're very proud of them and you know they're still young. Yeah. It's not over. No. Uh, I can assure you that there's lots of hunger there as you saw in the last 10 minutes yesterday. The appetite is there. They will need to switch off now but they'll go back to their clubs and they'll enjoy that and they'll go toe to toe with each other there. But, yeah, listen, I think they'll all have a little eye to the, the piece around the corner and next December, maybe January, you know, when we come back together again. I'm just very privileged to be doing the job I do. Believe me, I don't design the sessions. Paul does all that. You know, I don't look after him in the gym. We've had lots of great coaches in working with them. I'm just very privileged to be the leader, I suppose, of the group. It comes with responsibilities and there's tough days too, but I'm, I'm surrounded by fantastic people who make this job really enjoyable and we have great fun. We, we spend a lot of our time laughing and it's hugely important. And we have great laughs at the smallest of things, yes. But we have great fun and we're, we're very fortunate. We've met some fantastic people along the way. We'll hear more from John Kiley a little bit later on after half seven. In fact, that interview with our own Ashling O'Reilly this morning at the Team Hotel, he makes a salient point there, make the age profile of this Limerick squad. When you look at Kilkenny's performance, you set that against the fact that they are to a degree in transition, that the age profile of that team has gone up a little bit. Limerick are still a pretty youthful side. There are more All Ireland's um, multiples in this team. <laughs> Should they keep performing at the level at which they've been performing for the last four years? What was I saying to you about assumptions? No, they are young, and that's the that's the strange thing. I think I think Graham Catty might have been the only outfield player in his thirties uh, that started. I know Nicky Quaid obviously is as well. Graham McCarthy's thirty two. Everybody else in their twenties, but. It was a concern for me because sometimes it's not just what age you are, but it's like how many miles you have in the legs. And if you look at the 2018 uh, All-Ireland winning team that started against Galway, it's 13 of those, possibly 14, 13, I think, mm. um, started again this weekend, you know, and that is a lot. But the concern that you would have that eventually something has to give what's coming next, I think is in some way eased by the fact that that bench for two games in a row now have come on and have lifted them. And if that, that is, and these are young guys. Mm. So Walter Walsh and Richie Hogan are coming on for Kilkenny and making a huge difference, especially Walsh when he came on at half time. But for Limerick, it's the younger guys that are coming on and are lifting the team. And that's exactly what they need. So while the profile is still young and these guys aren't on their last legs or anything, they need one or two to come and just refresh it a little bit. And it looks like, the, looks like they're there. Yeah, we talked about the, the production line, I guess, in Limerick on last week's show as well. It's well worth dipping into that to see how what the effect that has had on, on Limerick hurling over the last while. But we've got some reaction as well uh, from Kilkenny, Emery. Yeah, the result means that Kilkenny's wait for another All-Ireland goes into an eighth year. Yesterday marked Brian Cody's 17th All-Ireland. He has, of course, been successful in 11 of them since he took over back in 1998. However, for obvious reasons, he was emotional speaking to Ashleen yesterday. Uh, look, I mean, we're the team came out on the wrong side of it, so obviously everybody is just heartbroken, I suppose. Um, but absolutely, the effort of our players is magnificent. Obviously, Limerick won the game with our standing champions and what they've achieved today, they've achieved three in a row, which is... You know, it tells its own story, so I can say it's full credit to them and well done to them, but huge um, admiration for what our players put into it. Yeah, you threw everything at them and you brought it back level. Do you think from then you were going to kick on? Well, I knew we were going to keep going at it. I also knew that um, you know, they were going to not lay down for sure, so it's going to, going to go to the very end and unfortunately we just came up short. Richie Hogan came off the bench. He got the, the point to level it. What a player. He's been exceptional for Kilkenny throughout the years. It was great to see him come on and have that moment. I know it didn't go your way in the end, but great for him as well to, to score that score. Yeah, for sure. Great point. Like, I mean, so many great scores during the whole game. Richie is just one player in the whole panel and obviously has given great service for sure. But like, again, I thought our players were magnificent. 
It's always a boost when somebody hears, you know, refers to you by your first name. Thanks. I, I just say you're just one person on Ash, the panel. Look at you, boy, <laughs> I don't like to get ahead of myself, Mick, as well, you know. Uh, a few texts in already. Atmosphere I was awesome. I'm one of my favourite All Ireland finals in 40 years. And uh, that's from Philip, who's text us from 53106. And somebody else says, Hey, Richie, surely the highlight of the weekend was Pixies in the Ivy Gardens, followed by a back garden hungover Sunday sports watching. Uh, hopefully, uh, the boys are happy with their parents. Thank you for that, Mark. I think a sex is in there. Um, yeah, saw the Pixies on Saturday. Uh, that's beside the point. Uh, the highlight of the weekend, though, uh, for anybody uh, guessing, is Bo's 1 0 win away to draw it up. But that's another story for another day. But this thing of comparing sports. Like we'll get to oh, it, I guess, yeah. when we get in the, into the the groans there, say it all already. Um, I, I don't have time for this. There, there, <laughs> there's been several occasions over the last few months where I was uh, glad that I was not on Twitter.com. Saturday morning was one of them because you could see from the jump that people were trying to, and I guess it, it played into it a little bit on Sunday's game, Sunday's game yesterday as well. People were trying to contextualise the win in New Zealand and pit it against other sporting events. When did we lose the ability as a kind of a wider populace to just accept an awesome thing as an awesome thing? Like an, an incredible achievement in and of itself. Like it's, <laughs> it doesn't have to fight. It's, it's not battling el- for elbow room with somebody else. It's not trying to do anybody else down. It's not trying to say that one thing is better than the other. It, the Irish rugby success in New Zealand is phenomenal. Let there be no doubt about that. It is utterly phenomenal. Is it better than... the? Like, X achievement by the Irish soccer team or by Kelly Harrington or Katie Taylor boxing ring. No, because the two things are not comparable. It, it got so my what are we here for that? To just talk about the thing. Have, have a bit of debate and a bit of conversation. You can have debate and, and conversation, but like, there's, there's no point comparing you know, apples and architecture. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I don't think there's any, there's any harm in having a bit of a... a I suppose a hierarchy of achievement that's purely subjective and leads to a bit of conversation and a bit of argument. So long as it doesn't come <coughs> from what I would describe as a dark place of Garth Grungy's dark place. No, a dar- a, just a, a begrudging dark place. And I think it comes from both sides. Don't get me wrong. I think yeah. there's a. There, I do. I do think the louder force are the people who want to say that what Ireland did on Saturday morning doesn't matter. And They're only a bunch of friendlies, Mick. The friendly word and so on. Like, that's like so objectively untrue and just you know, said with the intent to needle. Yeah. And just it's, and, and I, I think it's, I think that's a fair. Now, don't get me wrong. I do, I do think there's a lot of it from the other side who will say something like, you know, oh, the World Cup they didn't even <laughs> do anything. In, you know, Ireland only made a quarter final, they only beat Romania. And that's as much nonsense as anything else or dismissing Olympic achievements or whatever. I don't think having a bit of uh, uh, trying to put something on a scale, again, when it's purely subjective and ultimately what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't really count for anything. I think that just could be a bit of crack and it's okay. But I do I do get where you're coming from, I do. There was a groan from you as well, Amory, when you're comparing, or we're talking about comparing. Yeah, well, it's pointless, the comparison, if you ask me. Sorry, Mick, but like, because it's <laughs> so... Want to shoot I'm not saying it's not pointless. I'm, not, I'm just saying it might be a bit of fun. It's just so subjective. Like, what one person thinks might be a great achievement, another won't, and that's just simple as. If you're from... West Cork or Skibbereen, you're probably going to think that the rowers over the last number of year, years trumps an awful lot of rugby achievements. If you're a female, you might have more of a resonance with Katie Taylor's achievements as opposed to a, a, a rugby side that's made up of males. You know, like it's just it's not possible to compare them. So I just I don't really see the point. I, I like and I, I get your point, like that a bit of argument and uh, yeah. a bit of banter is fun, but like it does veer really quickly into the nasty side of things. It does. That's yeah, the problem, Yeah, that's isn't the it? problem, like, yeah. It, it, and it, then it's... we're all of a sudden just putting sporting achievements down. Yes. And what's the point in that? Completely agree with that, yeah. I think Although that's I have, to say, I, I have a tear scale. Okay, it's like, you know, on. it's like how, how much is like seeing the somebody McCarthy celebrate scale. or somebody like, you know, set me off or set those around me off, you know what I mean? And that's it. Like, so Saturday was pretty good for that, but you bring it was, again, tears? because it was only on my own when I listened to the radio, yeah. it's hard to put it properly on the tear scale. Was there a moistness of eye at the full-time whistle? Um, like, I'm not, I think if I was there and watching live and had seen the Peter O'Matney images that everybody, uh, that I obviously saw. So I, seeing Peter O'Matney cries like watching your dad cry, essentially. I think that, I think that would have set me off. But like, don't, like, I mean, I've, uh, was I crying when Kelly Harrington dominated her way to the Olympics? Yes, so she's really high on the list. You know, that's the way it works. That's what sporting achievement is measured by. I can't, I can't picture you crying. Really? Yeah, can't see it. 
I'd been really sick for like a whole week and That'll it was like six o'clock in the morning and I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, does the earliness of a sporting <laughs> achievement, does Matt Holland's equaliser against Cameroon make you more emotional because it was at like half That's seven in the thing. morning? New Zealand's early in the morning, not as early as some things. Yeah. But yeah, I honestly think the, the context of like, you're not waiting around all day, you're just getting up you feel kind of a sense of achievement for getting up for these things that it's uh, <laughs> by themselves. <laughs> what you achieve by getting up for doing Ireland AM on Saturday, Mick, is up there what the lads achieved. And we're not against, we don't want to compare yeah, sports. If I but was you getting up at younger, seven o'clock. I was someone that, like, you know, would go out on a Friday night and, you know, my usual getting up time might be like closer to <laughs> 10 or 11 as it might have been 15 years ago. 11 or 12, actually. let's be honest. Those eight o'clock games were, were very, very hard work. You definitely felt the sense of achievement. Unfortunately, back then, though, Ireland used to always get hammered. So. Oh, God, I'm reminded of having to do a full day's work after uh, Cameroon, Ireland in 2002. Oh, yeah. Like, literally, and there's like an hour after the full-time whistle before I started work. <laughs> the, the day is just completely askew. Um, never trust a man with a mullet, I think has never been truer, Anne-Marie. No, Open champion Cameron <laughs> Smith has refused to be drawn upon claims that he is set to join the new Saudi-backed Live Golf Tour. The 28-year-old Australian didn't answer questions on rumours linking him to the breakaway league after his win at St Andrews yesterday. Elsewhere, Henrik Stenson is expected to be stripped of his Ryder Cup captaincy with the news that he is also set to join the controversial tour. And it was Cameron Smith who beat Rory McIlroy into third place. I can't remember who was second. It was the other Cameron. Cameron Young. That's the one. Um, at St Andrews at the Open he yesterday. The 18th. Uh, he did, he was a two. <laughs> yeah, at a par four. It was like, and just insane shots as well from Cameron Young. He was trucking along there looking like he could for a second. He was the open leader at the 18th. Went another couple of holes, you wouldn't know, but uh, God, Smith was just unstoppable yesterday. But the putting yesterday was incredible. I was watching, I was double screening, and I was trying to just kind of, I kind of figured it would be Rory in the shake-up at the end because he'd been so good all week. And I was just kind of watching his demeanour, especially off the tee, and he looked so calm, level-headed, assured. He was hitting the middle of the fairway pretty much every time. He was, there was no sense of impending danger about him until it clearly got in the back of his mind that Smith was draining putts for fun and was picking up was it, five birdies in a row and then from that point on you could kind of see McElroy's demeanour changed a little bit but to his credit I don't think he changed it, his game didn't change he was just wasn't you know, he was making parts across the board I think he got two birdies yesterday two somewhere. birdies two Bog birdies bogey yeah. free round you know and the final the day open, of the Open when the, his yeah. playing partner who they had they shared a four shot lead you know basically well not collapse is too strong a word but he wasn't a factor Hovland and you would just think you know one or two birdies, not birding the 14th, the par five, easy par five, a lot, a lot of that kind of stuff. Like he just, his putts weren't going in and he wasn't hitting it close enough. But he never, there was never a moment where it was get, it got away from him or anything like that. And you have to say, Smith went out and shot 64 on a Sunday. In, uh, on the old course, on the final day of the exactly, Open. you know, I think, and, and I just think, he deserves it for it and uh, you know, now he's off to live golf and <laughs> the Stenson one, we think of it all this The Stenson one is like, is, it, that was the point at which last night when I saw that news that I figured at some point these three entities are going to get around the table and try and hammer this out because I don't know if the, was it the DP World Tour as it is now can stand to have their European captain walk away and just go, all right, we'll find another one. Yeah. It, it, we're reaching a kind of a point where there's so many people going that to deny them the ability to play on these tours doesn't seem feasible if you want to continue to have them be draws in and of themselves. Yeah. At the same time, I think Nathan Murphy pointed this out on, on Twitter earlier. It's like, would Live Golf even be that interested in Henrik Stenson? Would know. the offer have been as good as it was if he wasn't the Ryder Cup captain? It just feels like they're full on... Well, they're interested in Martin Keimer. ...SH1T stirring at the moment. Like, you know what I mean? That they're, They've got Keimer, I think. But I just feel, I wonder how much... like They had to lure Stenson away from a very, very, very prestigious golfing job here you know and he knows that he's going to lose this job over going to it it's like it just feels like they're trying to say we're going to upset the apple cart at every Possible juncture, juncture here yeah. so here we go Ryder Cup captain let's test your resolve we'll take him you know I, I feel I it's 
Dirty tactics, Richie. Dirty tactics. <laughs> it's dirty tactics indeed. Uh, in no way connected. Um, we're off to Europe uh, tomorrow. More Irish people involved in, in European action, Emery. Yeah, Shamrock Rovers have been handed a difficult tie as well if they can get past Ludogrets in the Champions League qualifiers. The hoops have been drawn to face the winner of Dynamo Zagreb and Shkupi's tie. The Croatian champions are, of course, hot favourites to come through that qualifier. They featured in the group stage of the Champions League five times since 2011. Rovers are currently in Bulgaria preparing for the first leg of their second round tie against Ludogrets tomorrow evening. Elsewhere, former Shamrock Rovers midfielder Aaron McAneff has left Hearts. That's 18 months after moving to Scotland to sign for Australian side Perth Glory. Meanwhile, Liam Kerrigan is the latest Irish player to move to Italy. His deal to swap UCD for Italian Syria B outfit Como has been confirmed. Do you know who his next teammate could be? Sesc Fabregas. Fabregas is considering a free transfer because obviously he's a free agent. Yeah. Como were in from late last week. When I saw that like pop up, I was like, Liam Kerrigan and Cesc Fabregas. Yes, Fabregas, why not? That's like, it's fantastic. Not to mention that Serie B is going to be the place to watch for uh, yes, Irish fans this year. Does anybody have the rights for Serie B over here? Because I think now might be the time to invest. We've got Aaron Connolly banging him in for Venezia, yeah, and Kerrigan. Um, and more than that. Like, But... Uh, can I just say, without going into it, and we won't even read them out as ever, the texts are in the, you know, basically we're being told that yeah. it is in no way subjective. But we're, that we're, it's in no way subjective. Right. Okay. Ireland's performance yeah. and win in New Zealand yeah. cannot compare to actual glories. And also, it's in no way subjective because it's better than anything that we've ever done. Basically, our texters are telling us how it is on both sides of the fence. So what you're saying is... It's subjective. Yeah. <laughs> We're wrong on both. That's <laughs> right. Who would have guessed it? Um, there's uh, Women's Euros action as well tonight, Anne-Marie. Yeah, there is. Belgium, Iceland and Italy are all in with a chance of securing the last quarterfinal place at the Women's Euros tonight as the final group games take place in Group D. Iceland are currently second in that group. That's ahead of their meeting with already qualified France in Rotherham. Belgium and Italy then are both on a point ahead of their meeting at the Manchester City Academy. Kickoff in both games is at 8 o'clock. It's not all happy uh, talk coming out of the series win over New Zealand though. No, Irish prop Andrew Porter has been cited for a high tackle during their series deciding win over New, Ca- New Zealand in Wellington on Saturday. 26-year-old Porter was yellow carded by referee Wayne Barnes following his 50th minute high challenge on All Blacks lock. Brody Retallick. His hearing will take place tomorrow via video link and he could face up to six weeks of a ban. He was lucky. Yeah, like we should be dispassionate about these things and it doesn't take anything away from Ireland's achievement or from the win and how like incredible it was. But I feel like we'd be up in arms about this if that was a New Zealand player not sent off or a player from another country. I, it, and it, I seen Luke Fitzgerald say exactly that, that it was a red card and we have to cop on to ourselves. You know, and for, we're doing pieces on last week on World Rugby and how they might not be taking this issue seriously enough. Mm. The Ryan Jones news this week, 41 years old, the former Wales back row, early onset dementia. It's absolutely devastating. It's and, terrifying. And, and terrifying. And it's just, we're going to have more and more of it and it's awful. And, you know, it would have been a disaster for Ireland, for Andrew Porter to get sent off, for something that, like, uh, there's no malice in whatsoever, but it's what that needs to happen. It needs to be completely taken out of the game, and it should have been a red card. Yeah, the, the, I guess he said there was no mitigation, Wayne Barnes, in how he judged the tackle to have taken place, uh, but he says it was an absorbing tackle, not a dominant tackle. Yeah. I don't think Held that, that kind of, yeah. yeah. Even still, like, it, it, everybody looking at that, even like I was listening to the radio myself and it was uh, it was Michael Corcoran and Don Lennon commentating on that and I think they instantly said oh he's, he's in trouble here this yeah. is a red yeah. and it, there was a lot of surprise that it was just a yellow and to be for, for these kind of challenges to be taken seriously and for the game to look like it's addressing the issues of concussions there needs to be adequate response to what we saw which is like that should have been a red all day long and if to be fair he was off the pitch for 10 minutes we conceded two tries but the, man, the way in which they managed those 10 minutes Ireland that is was actually phenomenal. Uh. So whether it would have made that much difference to the result, I don't know. Uh, the Ireland-New Zealand 
head-to-head continued up in Stormont though today, Emery. Yeah, Ireland and New Zealand at Stormont played out their first of their T20 International Series today. Not so good though for Ireland. The tourists batted first and set a target of 174 to reach. However, New Zealand won by 31 runs. That has just finished up there. Yeah, Ireland bowled out for 142. And before we shoot off as well, um, I was uh, completely entranced by the World Athletics Championships on Friday night because it was streaming it live uh, on their YouTube channel was watching the 4x400 mixed relay team perform brilliantly Rashida Adelaki is already looking like she's having an incredible games and we've got more action this evening yeah, unfortunately though, Tom Barr and Andrew Kosserin's World Athletics Championship campaigns ended at the semi-final stage overnight. Kosserin's finished 12th in his 1500 metre semi-final in Oregon. Barr then said he was very disappointed to have placed fifth in the semis of the 400 metre hurdles also overnight. Some breaking news, I know we're out of time. Hit me. Lean Cattle confirmed Tipperary manager in a three-year term. Don't think anybody's massively surprised. But Who that saw that coming? F. Waterford last week, Colin Bonner, relieved of his duties. Yeah, I think <sighs> it's an amazing confluence of events, really, isn't it? Considering how, and I know he's going to say this because he was already in the job, essentially, and he was at that point. I think Cahill had been asked a week or two prior to the Bonner relieving of duties. Um, would you be interested? He's like, no, I have a job to do here. And he seemed fairly, it wasn't just a, oh, I have a job to do here, it was... Fairly lying in the sand. No. Yeah. It's not my time yet. Yeah. That's me. I remember quick. Stephen Gerrard doing an interview, uh, getting really annoyed at somebody asking him if he was going to have his head turned uh, <laughs> when he was Rangers manager. <laughs> and a week later, he was Villa manager. Not at all. So there not you go. At all. There you go. Uh, something I guess we'll put to uh, Shane McGrath and to Jamesy a little bit later on as well as part of our look back on Limerick's All Ireland hurling final success. Uh, the guts of that is going to come up after nine o'clock. We're also going to talk to the one sober Limerickman left in the country. He's coming into the studio <laughs> after half past seven. And we'll also look at Ireland's series win in New Zealand with Keith Wood and Matt Williams. That's up after eight o'clock. But now it's cash machine time. Your chance to win big. News talks. Summer cash machine. Someone missed Barry's call at 3pm today. Can you blame them? They're probably sunbathing, which means we've got a rollover for the first cash machine of the week. If you've entered since 5pm on Friday, you're still in, but you must know this new number. €18,201.38. That's €18,201.38. And 38 cent. Uh, text play to 57557. That's 57557. Get your entry in by 3 pm tomorrow afternoon. Then across the Go Loud Network of Stations are about. Yes, even you, socks and sandals guy. Go on. Go for it with godating.ie. So, how's your constipation these days, Petsy? Oh, I've been taking Fibergel. It's full of fibers.